By the way, we're so glad to have Brother David Fan back yes. with us this morning. Good to see you, brother. Matthew 9, verses 35 through 38. As some of you may know, we've been going through a sermon series on prayer. And most of the passages that we've looked at so far have revolved around the themes of exhorting us to pray, encouraging us to pray, <coughs> telling us how much God longs to hear from His people in prayer, telling us how God desires to do great and mighty things in response to our prayers. But now, for the first time, we're going to see something that should be a part of the content of our prayers. And it's simply this. We need in our prayer time to ask God to send out more gospel workers. Okay. <laughs> As I think about that, I tell you, the word ask is not a strong enough word. The word that's used in the scripture here is actually to beseech God, yes. to plead with God, to beg God to send out more gospel words. <coughs> and furthermore, we're going to see that as we ask God to send out more gospel workers, that each and every one of us here needs to be one of those gospel workers. Let's go before God in prayer right now. Heavenly Father, <coughs> we need to hear from you right now, O oh God. We ask that you would speak to us right now. Lord, once again, we are reminded of the words of the little boy Samuel when he cried out, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Help us, Lord, to be a people who always regularly plead with you to send out more laborers who would bring the gospel message to a world that's lost and dead in trespasses and in sins. Lord God, maybe there's even somebody here this morning whom you are speaking to right now. Even. Hopefully it's everybody, oh God. Well, you would speak to us and say, not only do we need to be praying this, we need to be the answer to the prayer. Send us out. Lord, maybe also, there's somebody here this morning who doesn't even yet know you. We pray right now that as they, as they hear about your love, that they would say, yes, Lord. I'm giving you my life today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture here tells us that on a regular basis we need to be beseeching God to send out more people to 
do just the sorts of things that Brother Ellis was just describing to us. Beginning in the 35th verse, it says this. <coughs> Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word for his name's sake. Beseech the Lord to send out more gospel workers. As we look at this text, we're going to see three things that lead up to that exhortation to us to beseech the Lord to send out more gospel workers. The first thing that we're going to see is how we should feel about the laws. The second thing we're going to see are the words that the Bible uses to characterize the laws. The third thing that we're going to see is the tremendous opportunity that we as a church have to reach the laws. And then finally comes that exhortation for us to pray for ourselves that God would send us out to go and do that work of reaching the laws. First, how we should feel about the laws. Look down at the 36th verse. And you will see how Jesus felt <coughs> About the law. <coughs> We're going to see how Jesus felt when he went out and he saw people and he met with people and he talked with people and ministered to people. Look at the word that's used to describe his emotional state when he met with them. Same thing. He felt compassion. For them. He felt love for them. He had grace toward them. He felt mercy in his heart toward them. Let me ask you this question. When you meet people, that are lost in their spiritual condition, that are dead in their 
trespasses and sins. How do you feel toward that? <coughs> you know what's a sad commentary on the Christian church today? Is that many times we feel anything but compassion, love, mercy. Damn! 
Satan is. I'll tell you the third thing about our attitude toward non-Christians. You notice that God himself never had any attitude of contempt for them. If anybody had the right to have any kind of contempt toward the lost, it would have been the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But rather you remember what his word says in Philippians chapter 2. He tell, it tells us there that he came down out of heaven. He was living with his heavenly father up in glory. He was in paradise. And he was in all the splendor that paradise is. He could have stayed there. Think about that. He could have stayed there. But it says in Philippians chapter 2 that he willingly came down to planet Earth and planted himself right in the midst of the muck and mire that is this sin sick world. And it says there this, here's a word for you and me. It says he humbled himself. Some of us need to humble ourselves too. It says there he humbled himself and he became a man. But it doesn't stop. Because it says that he not only became just a man, it says that he became a servant. But even that isn't deep enough because if you look at that biblical word that's translated servant, it doesn't mean just really a servant. You know what it means? A slave. He became a slave. It's even deeper than that. Not just a slave, but a slave who suffered, who went to the most ignominious kind of death. Same death that a murderer would go through. The same kind of uh, 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 sentence that would be passed upon a dirty, rotten criminal at that time. got nailed to a horrific cross. Had those nails pounded into his hands and feet. Had that spear shoved up into his side and poured out his blood out of his love and compassion and grace and mercy toward you and toward me. When it says here in Matthew chapter 9, and he felt compassion for them. He already knew where all that compassion would take him. If anybody had a right to feel content toward the lost, it would have been our Lord Jesus Christ himself. And yet he felt just the opposite. Christian, you and I are called to follow in his footsteps to love the lost. To love the lost. To love the unsaved. To love people that the rest of the world may deem even unlovable. Let me tell you something about that word love. It is not just an emotion. It is an emotion, but it's more than that. It's also <coughs> an action word. You see, it says here that Jesus felt compassion, or he felt love, or he felt grace, or he felt mercy toward the lost, but it wasn't just a feeling that he didn't do anything.
So the first thing that we see is what we need to feel and how we need to act for the lost with compassion, with grace, with love, with mercy. Secondly, we see the words, the words that the Bible uses to characterize the lost. Look again at verse 36. It says there, first of all, that they were distressed. They were distressed with good reason. Guess what? If you're lost, you got the devil on your back. You heard that? If somebody is lost, if somebody's living in darkness, if somebody is dead in their trespasses and sins, you know what the Bible calls them? A child of the devil. Quite simple. That would cause great distress. That should cause great distress. And you see the way that folks around you are living and many of them are mired in distress. They're in emotional distress. They're in family distress. They're in financial distress. They're in every kind of distress that you can imagine. And the message that we have as Christians is that Jesus Christ wants to deliver them out of that distress. But the Bible uses more words to characterize the walls. Dispirited. Brother Ellis just told us about a lady who felt so dispirited that she was at the point of suicide. She's not alone. There are many others just like her. Jesus went out and he saw them as they were dispirited, hopeless, ready to throw in the towel and give up and say, I've had enough, I want out. There are more words that the Bible uses to describe the unsaved. Another word is the lost. Have you ever been lost? Have you ever been in a situation where you just couldn't find your destination? Think about that. Think how long you were lost for. Maybe it was 15 minutes. Maybe it was half an hour. Maybe it was an hour. Now think about this. When somebody is spiritually lost, they are lost not for 15 minutes, not for half an hour, not for an hour, but for all eternity. Think about this. Sometimes that lostness involves just being in a state of spiritual confusion. You have folks out there, and they're bouncing from one religion to the next, to the next, to the next, and they're searching for something. They might not even know exactly what they're searching for, but there's a God-shaped hole in their heart, and it's something that they know needs to be filled. They just don't know how to fill it. Jesus came to fill it. Sometimes loss means they're living in a state of confusion. But I'll tell you something else. Sometimes loss means living in a state of certainty. I'll tell you what I mean. You've got some folks out there who are, whatever religion they are, Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist or what have you, and they are certain that they are right. They have been so deceived by the devil 
that they've swallowed his lies wholeheartedly. And yet you and I, you know what we have? We have the truth. We have the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you know what? When Brother Ellis goes to London, I'm sure he's going to be a lot of people who are certain You know what your message to them is going to be in part, brother? You're certainly lost. That's the certain thing. You're lost. The Bible characterizes the unsaved not only as uh, uh, distressed and dispirited and lost, the Bible also characterizes them as in darkness. In darkness. Jesus talked about the fact that men loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. Have you ever been in a room that's pitch black? <coughs> People are afraid to be in rooms like that. Even for a moment. Just for a few seconds, it's terrifying to them. Well, you know what? Anybody who's unsaved, the Bible tells us that they are in the kingdom of darkness. There is a whole spiritual kingdom out there that thrives on darkness, that loves darkness, that glories in darkness, and wants to see more and more people steeped in that darkness.
It's not a spare harvest. It's not a partial harvest. It's not that some of the field is ready. It's that all the field is ready. It says the harvest here is plentiful. Here's the problem, Lord. It says that the workers are few. Some of you have worked on farms and you've harvested crops. Picture this sad picture for a moment, if you will. The cotton has all developed. And it's all ready to be picked. It's all ready to be harvested. And yet there aren't enough workers to harvest the cotton. What's going to happen in that case? I'll tell you what's going to happen. That cotton, instead of being harvested and being used for all that God intended it to be used for, you know what it's going to do? It's going to rot right there on the planet. And we as a church, that's what we're doing in many cases to God's harvest because of our lack of energy, because of our lack of love, because of our lack of concern, because of our lack the harvest rot on the planet. Do you remember what the Lord Jesus said about the harvest that rots on the planet? About, let's call them the weeds. You know what happens to them? They get pulled up and thrown into the fire. Mm -hmm. Only in this case, it's an eternal and so, when we see what the Word of God says here, <coughs> how we should feel and act toward the lost, the words that the Bible uses to characterize the lost, the opportunity that we have <coughs> to reach the lost, look at what our response should be. It's there in the 38th verse. What do we need to be doing? We need to be beseeching God to send out more and more gospel workers into his harvest field. <coughs> I'll tell you something interesting about this. You may have noticed this. Technically, when you really look at this closely, this is not, first and foremost, a prayer for the unsaved to become saved. I know that may shock some. Certainly that, that kind of prayer request is a biblical, Christ-centered prayer request, and we need to be praying that. But this prayer right here, primarily, first and foremost, is not a prayer re uh, request, let's say, first for the unsaved. You know, you know this is a prayer for? It's a prayer for me. It's a prayer request not for the unsaved, but for the saved folk. It's not a, a prayer request for the unchurched folk. It's a saved for the church, prayer for the church folk. It's something that we need to be praying for. Here's the interesting thing about this prayer. It's that first we are the people doing the praying, and yet at the same time, in many ways, listen to this, we are the answer to the prayer. Think about that. Beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers or workers into his harvest field. Let me tell you something. When you get to praying like that, when you get to praying in that way, God is going to move you to be one of those workers in his office. You will be both the praying person and the answer to that prayer. 
And this here is a call not to a few of us. See, here's the problem. We'll look at a guy like Brother Ellis, and we're so proud of you, by the way, brother, for what you're doing. But we, we, we'll look and we'll say, oh, that's God's calling for Brother Ellis. He's the one that should be going out and doing that, that kind of work. And we kind of separate people and say, well, there's a kind of a special class of people that should be going out and reaching the lost and preaching and going on mission trips and doing all sorts of these things and what have you. It's every one of us. It's every one of us that needs to be doing this kind of praying, and it's every one of us that needs to be doing this kind of work. You know what? Maybe you can't go to London. No worries. You know what? Can you go to your neighbor? Can you go to the guy who sleeps in the bed next to you? with the downtown rescue mission? Can you go to your friends? Can you go to your family members? I was so proud a couple of weeks ago when Brother Wayne took me around and we were telling people about the bridge. I think we went to almost every family member that he had. That's the kind of thing that we need to be praying for. That's the kind of thing that we all need to be doing. We need Sending out workers into his spiritual harvest, and then we also need to be those workers. Let me tell you something else in closing. Maybe this is all a moot point to some of you here, because maybe you don't even know. Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior in the first place. Let me tell you something. I think Jesus is speaking to you right now. If you are in that spiritual condition, and you know what? The love that we spoke about is directed towards you. <coughs> The compassion that we spoke about is directed towards you. The grace and the mercy that we spoke about is all directed toward you. Come and experience that love and that grace and that mercy today. He is beckoning you. He is beseeching each in you. He says in his word, come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Yes. Yes. And there's somebody here today that needs that spiritual rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So you know what that means? You get to take off. You get to take off your heavy load. You get to take off all that has burdened you. Especially your own sin and rebellion toward God. And you get to give it over to Jesus. And he takes it. Himself. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We get to trade our heavy burden for his light burden. As he says to us, for my yoke is easy and my burden Will you come to him right now? I'm not going to even ask anybody or bow your head. If you want to come.
come to Jesus, you know what? You just slip up your hand. As a matter of fact, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do something even more than that. I'm going to ask you to come up to the front. If you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior right now, God has been speaking to you and saying to you, what you need to do. I'm not going to draw this out. I'm not going to prolong it or anything, but I'm going to give you an opportunity. You know why? God said this. He was ashamed to be before men. I will be ashamed of him before my Father in heaven. God is speaking to you right now. You just come on forward. I want to pray for you. Is this somebody? Yeah, 